That completes our public participation and brings us to our action agenda. Item number 17, which are items that uh, need action from matters discussed in the executive session. I think we only had one item. Item 2A, selected employment items. Do I have a motion? Ms. Hammond. Do I have a, have a second? Everybody make sure your green light is on, please. We got it. I have a second. Does somebody second that? It's not on. It's not on. Second. Just a second. Mr. Kate, second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That passes unanimously. Brings us to item number 18, which is first reading approval of the proposed revisions of board policy IHAM health education shown in Exhibit C. Dr. Melton. Thank you, Chairman Gant. Board members, if you'll join me, as Mr. Mr. Gant said, in Exhibit C to discuss health education for our first reading this evening. Last time we met, I shared with you that this was, um, these revisions were to make sure that we were in alignment with the Comprehensive Health Act. What I would like to offer tonight is just a little more information for you because obviously this impacts <coughs> our health education program, of which is driven by our curriculum. Our curriculum, of course, is dynamic. We're constantly changing to make sure that we're responsive to state standards, but also things that are happening in our society so that we can fit our curriculum to the needs of our students. If you'll look in the paragraph, uh, the fourth paragraph that begins comprehensive health education includes instruction that maintains, reinforces, or enhance, and that paragraph continues for another sentence to follow. This can be very um, jargonish for the community to understand, so I wanted to pause on that paragraph this evening to offer some examples of what's described here as health, health-related skills, or even the health attitudes and practices of our children and our youth. This can range in opportunities that may be for a child to cover their nose or to cover their uh, mouth when they're coughing or when they're sneezing, all the way up to reducing exposure to UV, ultraviolet rays, all the way up into the high school where we can talk about alcohol use, um, caffeine, caffeine consumption, and also the diseases that our students can be uh, learning more about to make sure they're being proactive with their own health. But since we have this broad statement here about health and the health-related skills and the health attitudes, I wanted to pause there this evening just to make sure that you understood those are some of the examples that could be included. Obviously, that's driven by our standards that are adopted at the state level, but we also have some design here at the local level. We can adjust our curriculum to match the needs that we see. So I wanted to pause there to make sure that that was understood, but there's not been any noted revisions in the policy from the discussion from last time, but I thought that may help warrant some conversation to make sure that the board was clear as to some of the themes that could go into those, um, those areas within this policy. I'd be happy to answer any questions, Mr. Gant, should anyone have any this evening. Questions? Concerns? Okay, seeing none, um, I'm off track here. Did we get a motion? We didn't. Okay. I need a motion for first reading approval. Ms. Hutchinson. I move that we give first reading approval of proposed revisions to board policy IHAM health education as shown in Exhibit C. And a second. One second. Ms. Hammond seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. That passes unanimously. That brings us to item 19, which is first reading approval of proposed revisions to board policy ADF school wellness. And again, Milton. Okay. Um, exhibit D is actually Mr. Richardson's and I. We're, we're kind of sharing this with Mr. Richardson's giving me the finger, so I'll take it and carry it on. Mr. Beanbo is here with us again this evening. We're bringing forth. I'm sorry, pointing at me. Can we delete that, Ashley? Okay. At least everyone's listening. Okay. <laughs> Are you blushing or am I? Okay. Um, <laughs> Exhibit D is wellness. Mr. Richardson and I shared this through some committees that we've had, but Mr. Bimbo has actually led the committee discussion. Uh, based on the last revisions, um, the, during the discussion, Mr. Bimbo, anything that you would like to share that may have been revised since the last time? Thank you, Dr. Melton, Mr. Gant, school board. Uh, we have one addition uh, in the middle on page four. We, uh, Ms. Hammond asked uh, about smart snacks, so we've added a paragraph that kind of gives an overview of smart stacks and I think Ms. Sybil has sent a link to all of you 
discussing smart snacks just to help clarify what smart snacks were. So, okay. and that's and, and we had added re-added our introductory that was left out was back on the agenda. Everything else is the exact same that you voted on last time. <coughs> Any questions from the board? Mr. Bimo, you're trying to confuse me too. You said we voted. We just had a discussion of it last Disca time. Yes, sir. Okay. Discussion. I'm you, sorry. You're, you're trying me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, seeing none, I'd entertain a motion for first reading approval. Ms. Hutchison. I move that we give first reading approval of pr proposed revisions to board policy ADF school wellness as shown in Exhibit D. Got a second. Mr. Haltwanger seconds. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please raise your hand. And that passes unanimously. That brings us to item 20, which is our second and final reading of the proposed general fund budget for 2017, 2018, shown in Exhibit E. And um, probably need to start with a motion. Ms. Hutchison. I move that we approve the 2017, 2018 general fund budget in the amount of $181,891,358. This includes an increase in millage of 2.16%, which is 5.4 mills, as allowed by Section 6-1-320 in the South Carolina Code of Laws. And do I have a second? Mr. White seconds. And now um, discussion, Mr. Richardson, we'll go to you if you need to highlight anything, or we're, how would you like to handle this, or just? Thank you, Mr. Gann. I don't really have a whole lot to add from what I presented earlier, so I'll be glad to try to entertain any questions that the board may have. Okay. Ms. Hutchison. I wanted to ask about the, I think it was in the yellow book under <coughs> fee schedules, and I think this, the first part of this question might be for Dr. Melton. I noticed that um, we still have fees for the IB classes. We were able to eliminate the fees for the AP. And I was wondering what those fees cover. Okay. And I guess the, what I'm wondering, based on um, what your answers are, is this something that the school district can absorb? Well, first, I give credit to Mr. Richardson and his team, and of course, to the board, because with last year's um, budget, being able to reduce some of the fees that our parents incurred really helped us standardize some things. So as Mr. Richardson and his team have worked on this, and Mr. Richardson met with each of our principals, just for the community to know, because I suspect the board is already aware, IB classes are solely at Irmo High School. So as we started making decisions and recommendations as to where's the right place to help with some fee adjustment, Obviously, Irmo High School has the IB program, and Mr. Richardson was able, with the board's support, to make sure that we were able to offset some situations where if a child is on free or reduced lunch, they still have the opportunity to participate without having the, um, the fee to prevent them, prevent them from being involved. So since AP classes, advanced placement classes, are often system-wide, and IB is uniquely at Irmo High School, that was one of the areas that we discussed as what do we do? Do we stay with the standardized, what is accessible to all students, or do we look at it uniquely depending on the um, needs of an individual campus? And of course, IB is very unique, specialized program situated there to attract students into Irmo High School and also to retain students at Irmo to give them a competitive opportunity for college, college and scholarships. So that's a difficult um, recommendation, I suppose. Mr. Richardson may have a little bit more to add to that. Some of the fees do go towards students, of course, taking the exams that are required. Obviously, the supplies that we um, require for the courses, whether it's an enrollment fee through International Baccalaureate Program, whether it's a particular workbook or resource that a child needs to supplement the textbook and the other opportunities that we have. But of course, there is the exam that is required that the student needs to pass to get credit for the IB class of which they've taken. We did have conversations, should we take and eliminate some of the fees from the IB program specifically for the core area, but maybe not the exploratory areas, the arts and the um, beyond the core area of science, social studies, um, ELA and, and for math. But that's something we would certainly take some guidance from you all on, but what am I forgetting that we've discussed that I need to add? Okay, does that help you, Ms. Hutchison? 
Um, yeah, it, it does help a lot. I suppose my, my thoughts on this is that I would hate for the fees to be something that makes us lose enrollment. Maybe Absolutely. families might choose the AP right. over the IB for these high achieving students. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, I talked to Mr. Richardson earlier and I know he doesn't have the, because I didn't ask in time, to find out what it would cost, um, what the impact, financial impact, if we did away with these. I can see us leaving the, this in the budget, mm -hmm. but I would like us to take a, a second look. I know you can always eliminate mm -hmm. something, um, and perhaps there are different fees, but, but my concern, uh, which was brought to me by a very um, astute, um, uh, very involved um, community member, would be the fact that it might detour families and students from the IB program. I think we very much appreciate that, particularly on behalf of our students who are interested in the IB program. I would like to celebrate, and I don't have those numbers in front of me, but the last two years we've been looking at the profile of the IB student at Irmo High School, um, and I'm proud to say that program has nearly doubled in the last four years, so we are attracting students and retaining students in this IB. Uh, last year, Irmo High School's IB diploma program was second in the state of completer rates, so I very much celebrate the work of our staff at Irmo High School, our counselors, and of course our students and their family support. So I think that's something um, that Ms. Richardson certainly could take a look at, but I'll look to him for that. I love the idea of eliminating if we could, though. We do have scheduled, I think it's 50000 to help with Irmo High School's IB program just to make sure that the fees don't become an issue, but also to support the training of teachers and the materials that they need as well. So we'll need to do a little more investigation, as you said, a second look. Right. And, and I appreciate it. And I've, I've always known that it costs more to have the IB programs because yes, of the training. And yes, ma'am. The training locations are not always, you know, we have to take planes. And Absolutely. And I, I know that that is um, more expensive. So that's why I would not want to suggest anything tonight <coughs> without y'all having a chance to really look at the numbers. But... Um, I do know that these students, the IB students, just like the AP students, this is very beneficial when they go on to college Absolutely. because it, it does help them solve some of the, uh, or uh, take advantage of mm -hmm. the credits, the pre-credits, so they don't have to pay for those in college. And mm -hmm. it really does, uh, it helps students get through college using their scholarships in four years and all sorts of other benefits. So um, whatever we can do, at a, on a reasonable basis, I would appreciate. Thank you. Thanks. Further questions? Ms. Hammond. Ms. Hammond, is your green light on your microphone? Let's, let's get it to stay on, I think. There we go. Yeah. Um, the allowable mill, uh, millage increase <coughs> is 2.16%, uh, correct? And that comes out to the amount of one million three hundred thirty-one thousand six hundred eight. Am I right? That's correct. Okay. Um, Est estimated. Estimated. Um, I'm glad that Mr. Haltawana talked about respect for all of us. I know that I, I am the I'm, I'm fiscally conservative, but I, I also am, education is important, and I know it costs money. But what what I'd like answered is it seems that every year we have a shortfall, and at some point. And as we bring on new schools, that's even more money. Um, and I, sometimes I think, is there a better way for us to plan ahead? I know that some years we have, and Mr. White, um, I think, eloquently put it uh, when he argued with the, and, and led the fight with the legislature about Act 388 that hurts us. But as a board member, just the, the three years we've been on here, we, we increased the taxes uh, one year at the, the allowable amount, which we could go back, whatever, for one year. I, I'm not sure about the exact, but I know we raised it like 15.5%. Uh, and then last year, we didn't, and we were able to give uh, a, you know, a nice bonus to all employees, a one-time bonus. So I am uh, big about looking at the fund balance sometimes to just continue to give the break until we do plan better, and how will we, um, 
how can we best start planning not to just every year raise whatever the allowable amount is? And so um, I would ask fellow board members, you know, would you be willing to look at some type of compromise instead of the full 2.16% that we can, we raise a, maybe 1% and we use remainder to reach that same amount with some of the fund balance. And I do understand fund balance. I, I mean, I, I learned that from this board. I know that it's like a savings account. I know it's not reoccurring expenses. It's dangerous to use it and use it up. I, I agree. But I think that if I looked at, like 10 years ago, at some point we used to have an 8% sort of rule. That was what we kept it in. And then we increased it and we increased it. And I think for trust, for me, with tax, and I have raised taxes before. I'm not saying I never do it. Before, I wouldn't be able to fund teachers and programs and uh, have the best. But I, I just don't, I am not liking to do it to the max that we can just because we can to, to prepare for the rainy day. I think it doesn't, I, I'm ready to say let's plan. Why, could, why did we do it that huge amount one year, then none last year? And then this year we're going to go back to raising it to the amount we can. So, uh, fellow board members, uh, I, I don't know if you would entertain an amendment to not raise it to the 2.16 percent and raise it 1 percent. And the uh, and I, I need to figure, you know, math your thing, Mr. Richardson, and what the amount that would mean we would use the fund balance for one time. Um, but I may not get a second, so. I, I guess I, I just want to communicate with you guys. You know, I, I am consistent on how I feel about this. Um, and I, I really didn't know, you know, I haven't had any conversation. I do want to thank Dr. Hefner um, and Mr. Gant very much for um, the 2020 vision. And, and I'd send an email to ask for us to get some clarification for the public. And you did a great job of doing that. And I think that was the start that we needed. Um, but I, I'll make it a motion, and we'll see if there's any. And, and I, I think I already know how you all feel, but I hope you can respect how I feel. I think it's just a way to uh, help the businesses. I mean, they're still recovering from what we have put on them. And I know that it's not our fault that we, we didn't pass Act 388, but I don't think we're going to get rid of it anytime soon. So I'm trying to reach a compromise for businesses and still not tap into fund balance any more than we should. Ms. Hammond, I, what I hear you say is you want to make a motion, yes, an amendment to the motion. But, yes, sir. And <clears throat> the, what I don't know is, if I can put it like this, that I make the motion we raise the millage 1% and make up the other 1.6, you know, whatever we need to have it down to 4,000 uh, from fund balance. I just don't know the amount to put on that. So if you'd help me. Let's wait just a minute. We, yeah. You've made that as a it's motion. It's a motion. Yeah, it, it's an amendment. I it's think I'm going to have to do an amendment. Yeah. Because y'all got to vote on this motion, and I could be just out. So we're, we're <laughs> I'm hearing you make an amendment to the motion. Yes. yes. So so the, I'm gonna look it now. would be to pass the budget, but the amendment would be to change it, to amend it from the 2.16% to 1% and make up the difference with fund balance. That's my amendment. Okay. Yeah. But right, so fund the budget. I'm looking to see if you get a second to that amendment. Sure I'm not. And I'm not seeing a second, so the amendment Fine. would Thank die you. for lack of a second. Uh, and I don't know if Mr. Richardson, you had figures on that, but he it, didn't it, it, didn't, uh -huh. it didn't succeed, so I don't think there's a need to go there. I, I would address part of your concerns by saying that you're comparing years, and every year we're, we had two of our legislators here tonight, but we don't really know what's coming for us. Last year was an excellent year for our state and for schools, and I think that's the biggest reason we were able to give the step increases, the bonus that you mentioned, and so forth. I mean, it was a very good year. Mr. White, I applaud your efforts again because we made the plight of the fast-growing districts known that uh, what, what happens there. But I think every year, unfortunately, stands on its own to know, I don't think it's from a lack of planning, Nobody will tell us from one budget to the next they're going to guarantee us. We know what the base student cost by statute says it should be, and we're not close to that. So it's a, 
to me, it's, it's an issue for us to deal with. Mr. White. <clears throat> Um, I, I made a couple of notes, but I just uh, I think it's worth reiterating. Um, n number one, to say why don't we plan better? We you, you really can't plan something when you don't have control over your revenue, you don't have control over your expenses. To the extent we do have control over expenses, those are managed down. If we're going to say, okay, we're not we're not going to fund something, then what do you want to cut? And, you know, and, and well, unfortunately, 85% of our expenses are staff, so you're going to be cutting teachers. I mean, you can, you can dice this any way you want to, but if, if we miss our budget ability to pay our budget long term, we're going to be letting go of teachers. And that's just, that's just a reality. We've we sorted through that for years and years and years. But the, the thing that's different this year is, you know, when, no, number one, fund balance is sort of a gimmick for people politically to say, I'll use fund balance, don't raise my millage. The problem is those same expenses we cover with fund balance this year are going to be here next year, and they're going to be here the year after, and the year after, and the year after. And the problem is next year we're going to get another set of expenses. And if we don't have recurring revenue to match with every recurring expense, we're going to be laying off teachers. And they may be two years, three years, four years, we're going to be laying off teachers. We don't have the ability to go back and do it over. We can go back two years, and we did that once. One of the significant long-term effects of Act 388 is that districts around us that recognize what was going on raise their millage, no one is going to get frozen. This being a very conservative district, we never raised it, but what we had to get by to balance our budgets, and we had to fight to get that off, off, off a board, a mixed board many times. And to the extent districts around us have locked in layers of revenue above ours on when you adjust for different pupil sizes we're at a competitive disadvantage to retain the staff we have today so this year we had retirement I mean we you know we, we went to the legislature we talked about step increase we showed them that our annual millage increase doesn't even cover our statutory requirement of a step increase and they were also shifting money at another level to poor districts. Now they listened to us and they stopped the revenue shift and that <coughs> helped us try to close the gap on nothing but our step increase. But this year we now have these retirement shortfalls we have to fund and we're gonna have more we have to fund in the future. And I think the one thing from all those hours we spent talking to legislators and doing presentations was this isn't gonna change next year and it's going to change this year this is a long-term problem but if we're not matching reoccurring revenue against additional layers of expense that we get each and every year then we're going to hit a wall and when we hit that wall that fund balance isn't going to help us because we got to have that money year after year after year and one of the things that i showed the legislators and i showed in this budget session was we could use fund balance and never raise millage and be broke in about five to eight years and be laying off 100% of our administrative staff because one-time money only works one time. You can only spend one-time money one time. And right now, I mean, I don't think I can remember a year where we had such a small deficit if we raised the millage in recent time. Now, we were, last year was a better year, but to have those additional pension expenses coming on us. And next year, and that's an actuarial formula, next year they can come back and say, you know, our estimates weren't right and we've got to raise the projections of what y'all have to contribute. I mean, it's just a, a dangerous place until we see that either we, we know we got enough revenue to pay year after year or the legislature is going to change our funding, and I don't think there's any indication they're going to do that in the short term. Ms. Hammond, you want to respond to, to that yeah, or just and, another point? And I, I, I definitely get it that you would be broke in five years if you thought you could use fund balance every year. I think that it's just more of a gesture <coughs> to not raise the taxes on the public just because you can every year just to prepare for what your, your, your point 
I'm not disputing, but I'm I am believing that we could possibly be able to, you know, save the tax, save, especially, and this goes on businesses, and and you guys don't think so, but even when we raised it that huge amount because we could, there were businesses that that certainly support education, but came before us that that's a lot on them at one time. So my idea would not be to use up all the fund balance and to do it every year and not worry that, that you know, we wouldn't run out of it. I guess I, I'm an optimist in that maybe somewhere along the line, like Mr. White's talking about, they, they're going to get it that we, we, we have to have more funding from the state. But, you know, I still stand by the fact that uh, the, the plan, we, we can plan, and what do we do with, um, you know, how are we going to face the future uh, with the amount of revenue we need, and, and how can we continue to, to communicate with the, with the state legislatures so that we get the money. But um, it, it still bothers me that, uh, to me, it's a gesture that we are compromising on taxes are hard on people. And I know it's not much on a house. I saw that. But, but I still think it's, it's more of a, um, a it, it's, it's faith to me that we are working to, to get it right, that, that we don't get enough adequate funding. And look, I, I know about teachers, and I don't, want, I don't like to be thought of as I, I wouldn't want to you know, vote for a budget and not so that all the teachers lose their uh, their jobs. I'm not proposing this for one simple time. And we have used fund balance before. We have used it. This board has done that. So to me, especially with things going on now, and we're, we're looking at new school we need, I just thought it would be a, a, a very uh, fair gesture on our part. So I didn't, I didn't get it, and I, and I understand, and I respect your opinions, and I hope that you can respect mine. Any other discussion? I, I just want to add a quick point. We're, we're not, I don't think, at least my vote, I can't speak for the other people at this table. My vote is not to raise millage just because we can do it. My, my, my support of, of your motion is because it matches recurring revenue with the incremental expense that we know we have this year that's going to be here forever. And if we, you know, the, the one harsh reality of everything since Act 388 is we, we gave people a one-time bonus. We can't afford recurring raises. So this money is designed to keep the mandatory things funded. We might have to use that fund balance to give more one-time bonuses to staff at some point to keep them here and keep them from leaving to go to work for other districts. But this isn't to do it just because we can do it. It's to do it because I view it as essential, but I can't, in good faith, make a vote on the hope that the legislature is going to do something different. And the reality is we don't have control over this situation. If we had control over this and we could sit down and say, let's figure out how to do something different. But it's, you know, every year there, there's line items <clears throat> added that we have to fund and we don't have any say in it. And that's, that's the underlying problem. Mr. White. Mr. Gant, can I ask one more thing? Sure. I'm, go ahead, and then I'm going to make well, sure. Well, I, I was just thinking, we get criticism. This, this is a little bit, this is on this subject, but it's not about the, the particular motion. We get criticism about the fund balance. Um, what are things we have used it for over, say, the last five years? So that other, And I'm not talking about to meet a budget. So other than that, at, because I think that's something that we get criticism of, and we maybe shouldn't. We have been wise with it. We do, you know, we do need to keep 37 million in there so that we can, you know, what what is what is a major thing that we need that much money of the taxpayers sitting there in case we need it? Well, you said something earlier. I'd like for Mr. Richardson to talk about That's what I fund balance had. again. It is it's not a savings account. Am I not? Am I wrong on well, that? Well, I I thought it was to use when like in yeah. case we had a. And I will say I don't know if Mr. Richards wasn't here, but we were heavily involved in withdrawing funds from the fund balance during the time that the state went through some severe cutbacks, which yeah, is four, four or five years ago. And we survived that by being very lean and being delving in that fund balance numerous times. But 
Ms. Rissen, her, I know you weren't Berg, here at the time. Herb Berg called us in the middle of January when the state had a mid-year budget cut. And I forget how many millions of dollars he said, we got a requisition right now to keep our payroll going. Right. And so it was, I, it has happened. It was, <clears throat> it was millions of dollars, like five or six million dollars. I mean, somebody can go look it up. That's my memory. But we would have had to have laid off people mid-year to get through the year. But Mr. Gant, you on the board, you and Ed, and I guess in this room, when I was first, when we were first elected, I, what was the rule about 8%? Remember, we had people that would come there and fuss some, at us for keeping anything more than that, give us back our money, you know. Right. I mean, there we, were percentages we all, out there, but what the law said and what the Department of Education said, there was no rule about how much you had in a fund. It's, it, it's up and, to any and district. I would say those, right. those periods we went through, had we not had a healthy fund balance, we'd be in a, a position of lost a lot of great employees, probably cut a lot of programs, but we survived that. Let's let Mr. Richardson update us a little bit and, and tell me if I'm wrong. I don't view that as a savings account. Can, can I ask you? It appears we're de debating and discussing an amendment. No, we're, we're, that amendment's we gone nowhere. We're talking about the budget. The amendment's done. It didn't get yeah. a second. It didn't get a vote. So I'm asking Mr. Richardson to enlighten us a little bit. Would you do that? I, I will try <clears throat> to, um, to answer the, uh, well, first of all, I guess a fund balance is not a savings account. What it is is a snapshot. And in this case happens to be a snapshot on June 30th, 2016, where the $37 million comes from. But obviously our fund balance varies from day to day, depending on expenditures, what's coming in, what's going out. And I think as I've shown you in the past, you know, during the first four, five, six months of our fiscal year, we are really spending at a greater level than we're bringing money in. Um, and that's why you need a sufficient fund balance to, to cover that so you don't have to borrow um, tax anticipation notes to meet your payroll and your and your monthly expenditures. There, the board policy prior to 2012, I did go back and look, um, acquired eight and a half percent of our general fund budget to be in fund balance. That was changed in 2013, and it's based upon um, I guess. It's 15 to 18 percent of our general fund budget now is what we're required to have per our board policy. That's based upon, I guess, the average of districts that have one of the higher bond ratings, such as ours, and I think that's where that came from back in 2013. So basically, you just, what you've used it for, like you said, not a savings account. It's there that we have a shortfall, so you can, that, that's money you can use to meet payroll or to meet whatever it's cash that's flow come up. It's kind of, yeah it's kind of, yeah say like a, a credit card for lack of a better word you know and then you can pay it so what's the least it ever goes down to well it's not a credit card but i understand what she was saying yeah, it saying, keeps us going a, a, yeah, a tan would be more like a credit card. card for us if we had to borrow but um that's how it was explained to me but the, the concept she was correct mr richard would you would you equate it to somewhat if someone got paid on the 15th of the month, they got their full salary and pay for the month, and in that day, at that time, it was X amount, but that had to carry them till the 15th of the next month. And it, yeah. the first, first receiving it, you got most of it. At the next month on the 15th, you hope you got some of it, but that's what's got to carry you. And that's sort of the way I see the... It's basically like your checking account, like anybody's checking account. And you got certain times of the month where you have big, big, bigger expenditures than you do other times of the month, obviously. And, you know, um, I guess if you're in a job where your pay may fluctuate from paycheck to paycheck, that would, you would definitely need probably a bigger uh, amount of money sitting by to, to be able to cover you through those lean times. Well, in, in simple terms, me, if, if I got a, a, a deposit for pay and I looked at my checking balance that day, that time, and I said, oh boy, I can do something different with that. And I forgot I gotta pay my mortgage, I gotta buy food, I gotta pay for whatever services, and I spend it, and I think that's the fallacy. I'd be in, I'd be in a problem come two weeks or so when my mortgage, mortgage came due. There are, there are things that come that eat up that fund balance, and I, I think that I want to dispel this thing of a savings account. We hope at the end of the year, you hope that we have not. We don't over budget so we can create a fund balance. <coughs> we don't do that. We've heard that tonight, but we don't do that. 
You don't do that. Oh, you don't, Mr. You don't Gannon, I don't say we did. I, I'm not I saying didn't say that. You did say what, that. But, but I think it's very important that we communicate as a board to the public right. so that it is ex understood what it's for. And I guess what I'm asking, can you, can you use that for anything we need, any expense we need to pay? Or can fund balance only be used for certain <clears throat> expenses? that you need to use it for? Well, obviously, it's used for whatever's approved in our budget. If there are things outside of that, it I would mean. require board approval. Other than the budget? Correct. Okay. Like, for instance, we're using a portion of our fund balance now, which was set aside for capital projects, we'll be using for the new middle school edition. I got you. So, so we do use it, like, I mean, it's not just to sit there for until we, until while we can't play catch up. No, we actually, uh, on an annual basis, a uh, certain amount of it is assigned to things, um, various things. Uh, in this particular case, I think we have, I don't recall the amount now, but we have a certain amount set aside for future capital projects. Number one is obviously if we're going to purchase any type of property or we do any kind of additions or, or new buildings or what have you, that's what that would be used for. What's the lowest it's ever been this year? I don't, I don't know that off the top of my head. Ms. Hudson, do you have a question? I sure did, okay. um, or, or a statement. But I was just looking back to the slides um, where we had the budget considerations, and two of those in particular, pension reform and increased employer health insurance premium increases, which is 3.3%. Pension reform, I don't know what that amount is. Uh, plus the increased calls for terminal leave since Terry is ending June 2018. That, that's a lot more than what our normal operating expenses are. And this always happens. Of course, we have increases in, in utility costs. Um, it's just, you know, it probably increases in our liability insurance. I haven't heard that. But there are always expenses. And then looking back on a slide, page seven, which is a recap, it shows that if we do not raise millage, then our shortfall is $1.3 million. And I, to get $1.3 million, as Mr. White said, then we stop, start um, eliminating programs or eliminating valuable um, teachers and staff. And at this point, we have been running a very lean um, school district. Everyone works extremely hard. We're very successful. And so I, I think for us, and then even with the small, what was it, 2.16% increase, that still live, leaves us with a shortfall of uh, $4,300. So, if we were to continue and not increase by millage, then I don't know what, you know, what the recommendation, you know, what do you recommend we would eliminate um, in order to make up for $1.3 million? I just, it's, it's just not, we don't have that type of, of fluff in our budget. So, I mean, that would be my question to you. Well, my motion did not cut out anything. I would have used, I would have raised, I, I was talking about using some a millage increase and some of the fund balance, and you cut nothing. And, and if, if, if we ever have to, if we ever have to get in a, one of those terrible years we've been before, where, um, you know, like when you were talking about when Dr. Berg was here, you know, it, it may come down, but if it ever came down to cutting out any program, I would look straight to Dr. Hefner or whoever the superintendent was and, and the experts that work for our district to decide if they had to cut something. It certainly wouldn't be me as the board member to say you should cut this program. And I support every program in this budget. So, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm about using some of that fund balance and a small tax increase. And that didn't go so we probably ought to call for the question. Well, and actually, just to bring us all back to focus, yep. an amendment failed for lack of a second. So we are discussing the budget. And if, if we have other questions or comments, we're open to it. But if not, we've already got a, we've got a motion and a second. 
and um, you might have any other comments. On. I, I just want to reiterate because I, I really, I really think it's a fundamentally important point. It, it, it's apparent to me we can't sit at this budget table and just look at this year. I mean, that's the thing that when we started this thing with the General Assembly, we made a communication about look at the next seven years. And, and you really can't look at one year in isolation because this stuff compounds. And so whatever you leave behind today, maybe you don't cut anything today, but let's say we left half of this million three behind, and next year there's a, a million five deficit we start with because the, the, the health insurance premiums are up again and the actuarial assumptions in the pension were not correct. So you add the 700,000 to the million five, now we're looking at 2.2 .2 million. And, and you're in this constant trying to catch up, but these expenses are gonna come every year. And then in the third year, there's gonna be another one on top of that. And at some point, you're gonna to have to stop and say, okay, I can't catch this deficit, or I've gotta go back within that two year window. And then you gotta double up, and then it makes it more dramatic. And, and, and to me, fiscal being fiscally responsive and planning is making sure as you make commitments and you move forward in time, you have a plan that you can pay for that. And, and, and there isn't a way to say we can pay for something and the things that we're being asked to pay for are mandated by law. So we, we've either got to start throwing things away or we got to, we got to build a revenue stream that's going to pay for those things and the, and the big things. And I mean, who knows where health insurance is going to go in the next three years with Congress trying to change all that stuff. And, and it's just, and the pension stuff, I mean, I know that because I'm around that in my career. Actuarial assumptions are wrong all the time and people got to come back if the market didn't bring in the right returns and say, well, you actually got to put in more than we projected. And, and you're just playing this constant catch up. And so it's, it's a, my, my point is we have to look multi-year. We can't look to a single year and, you know, Michael, to you know, raise your point, I mean, this is important because to talk about this in our budget sessions, because when somebody comes out and says, particularly they do it with the microphone, it's like, use our fund balance, don't raise our taxes. That sounds so easy, so inviting, but it's actually very complicated and it's very dangerous because it, it can get us to a place where we can't afford to keep our budget in place. Well, Mr. White, like Ms. last Ms. year, can I ask you a question? Ms. Hutchinson. Uh, I just wanted to, um, I guess add something when I was talking about the budget considerations and the um, costs that we we are required as a district. I neglected to me mention the step increases, which really is very significant. And as um, Mr. White explained last year to our elected <laughs> officials and others, showed how that was compounded. And I forgot what the amount was each year. Um, it's two percent in it. No, no. I mean, we had a, a dollar amount. Switch, I forgot. Yeah. yeah, and how that just compounded. And that's that is a huge um, uh, cost to our school district. It's great. It does help all of our employees, but it is another requirement that that we have no choice about. And so that does ensure that we just need to continue if we're able to. Um, if we have a deficit in our budget, that we have to cover it, and with you know small percentage, what, two point two percent. I'm gonna go to Ms. Hammond and Mr. Holt longer. Anybody else? And then we'll try to close this out. Well, <clears throat> one thing I, I would like to say, because it, it, talking about planning, it may be if if we never get this funding and, and we continue to have the costs put on us that we don't have any control over. It may that we, we need to do as a board, we may have to change the idea and we may have to use something like rezoning and put more people in schools that have lost enrollment down this way. Or we might have to, because um, that's, that's a big f amount of money is the employees and it's running the school. And so, and I certainly support a new school like in Chapin, but we might have to look if money's going to keep getting worse and worse, and every year we have to raise taxes because it's the only way we can re remain on top, we may have to look at ways to, uh, you know, with facilities to, you know. And so I just would like to make that point in this vote because we, we do have, we need planning. 
And when he, because every year we are short, every year. And last year we didn't raise the taxes. So, you know, I'm thinking there, are, there could be some years we didn't. So anyway, we, we, I know we're going back and forth, but I, I, I just want you to know that I feel strongly about um, the taxes if there's some type of compromise and still support the budget. So that's where I stood. Mr. Holtwanger. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, just uh, very, very quickly. Uh, um, this is always something mean, I've been on here three years, and it's 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 a very difficult topic. Of course, it's about money, but uh, I think uh, one of the to use Dr. Hefner's uh, uh, um, his opening statement usually in his uh, in his vision uh, discussion, he uses the words uh, extraordinary and dynamic. Uh, for this district, and I, I think our desire is to remain to remain that way. And in order to remain that way, um, we have to, or as a board member, I'm speaking for myself, uh, I have to make uh, decisions that may not be popular. And I didn't get on the board to make popular decisions for for people. Our, our main responsibility is educating our, our young people in safe and secure environments. And uh, we are limited, obviously, in what we can control. But, uh, and I think his closing statements are, if we are not extraordinary and dynamic, do we want to become ordinary? And he may use another term as well, but so we have to make that decision if you want to remain extraordinary and dynamic or do you want to be an ordinary district? So again, there, I think we have to, um, it's not a pleasant thing. Who wants to pay taxes? Anybody raise your hand? <laughs> no one, right? But it also, scripture says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's. So that's what that means. So um, again, it, it's a difficult decision, but it, it's something that must be done if we're going to, these young people that, are, that were here tonight, if we're going to continue to to educate them and all the other 17,000 in the district the best way we can. And uh, Mr. Richardson, I applaud you and your staff and all of you guys for doing the work that you do each year. Thank you, sir. Before we vote, I, I want to address just one little thing. We've talked about schools and facilities and, and that R word that we don't like to talk about, but I want to compliment the staff for making very strategic staff decisions, too. I know we don't have personnel in part of the district with small classes. I mean, there's a very optimum use of our staffing, and I think that's a hard thing when sometimes a teacher or a support person is asked to go to another school because they're enrollment may be a certain way, but I know that administrative team along with Dr. Heffner works very hard on that, looking at that, and I think our facilities are well used throughout the district, so I think optimum use is going on. We're, we're struggling with the budget every year, and, and it brings me back to what I started out tonight. This is our fifth time to talk about budget. We had a budget workshop. We don't have the answers, but we know what's before us and what to do, so I applaud all of you for, for weighing into it. If nobody else has anything else to offer or discuss, I would entertain, we've already had a motion and a second, but I would entertain a vote on the original motion, which is to approve this budget as given by Ms. Hutchison a little while ago. And see none, I'd ask all those in favor to raise your hand. All those opposed, please raise your hand. And that passes five to one with one person absent. And that, uh, thank you all for your good discussion on that. That will bring us to Item number 21, and that is to adjourn. I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Ms. Hutchison makes a motion. Mr. Um, White seconds. I thank you all for being here and participating in our board meeting tonight. Thank you. All in favor, please raise your hand and leave this building. Thank you.